Good morning, good afternoon, whatever time it is. I do hope that you're having a good time. This is Andrew Kamazinski. This is the eighth in a series of flipped class lectures, the seventh one that will be assigned as homework. In this video, we're going to look at validity itself and at making truth tables and several other related concepts. So let's go ahead and get started by doing some review. So the main things that we want to review are the general argument concepts and those concepts that apply to deductive arguments. A valid deductive argument is one where if the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. This sort of argument is truth preserving. The way it does this is that it uses a very limited number of operators and it follows three basic laws of logic. By doing these two things, it makes it so the arguments are able to guarantee that if you have true premises, you can have a true conclusion. So what are the three basic laws that we're talking about? They're here. So they are the law of non-contradiction. So A and not A cannot both be true. That would be a contradiction. We cannot allow that when they have the same meaning. The law of the excluded middle, which says that of A and not A, only one of them can be true when A has the same meaning. And the law of identity, which is that A has the same meaning throughout the argument and throughout when we are using it. For any term, any idea, we're going to say it has a consistent meaning. So we also looked at standard argument forms. So we have modus ponens. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. So if it is hot outside, then Dr. K is sweating. It is hot outside, therefore Dr. K is sweating. Modus tollens. If P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. So if it is hot outside, then Dr. K is sweating. Dr. K is not sweating, therefore it is not hot outside. Then we had disjunctive syllogism. Either Dr. K will eat a cheeseburger for dinner, or he will eat broccoli. He will not eat a cheeseburger for dinner, therefore he will eat broccoli. A hypothetical syllogism. If P then Q, if Q then R, therefore if P then R. So, if I receive my paycheck, then I am happy. If I am happy, then I will spend money. If I receive my paycheck, then I will spend money. Finally, there is a dilemma. So there are two different forms of dilemma. So in one form, dilemma is something where we have two claims, A or B. If A, then C. If B, then D. Then our conclusion is B or D. The other version is we have A or B. If A, then C. If B, then C. Therefore, C. So both of these are the same concept. The concept is that if we have a conditional and if we have an or, we can merge them to know something about what is happening. These are very standard patterns. I strongly suggest you learn to use these in your writing. These will be the cores of doing an academic paper in the Western style, and also this is the sort of thing that things like IELTS and TOEFL are expecting. So one other way we can look at this is we learned about some standard operators. We had the operator P, where if we negate that, it does the opposite. So if P is true, then not P is false. If P is false, not P is true. So this is the way that negation works. So negation works on only one thing at a time. So just to give an example, Dr. K is tall. Dr. K is not tall, then becomes false. To give a second example, we'll start with something false. I am presently living in New York City. Therefore, the negation that I am not presently living in New York City is true. So notice that to do this grammatically is a little bit more complicated than using the logical operators. Conjunction. A conjunction is something that is true when both parts are true. So Dr. K lives in Hokkaido and Dr. K writes philosophy. So that is two things that are both true. So Dr. K lives in Hokkaido and Dr. K writes philosophy together is true. Dr. K lives in Hokkaido and Dr. K writes novels. Dr. K does not write novels, so together this is false. So again, Dr. K writes novels, let's say, and Dr. K is married. So the first one is false, the second one is true. Together, that would be false as a conjunction. If both sides are false, it's false. So the easy word for this is often the word and. A conditional, this was one of the harder ones we looked at, a conditional is true in three cases. And those three cases are, one, if the antecedent is true and the consequent is true. So that's one. Two, if the antecedent is false and the consequent is true. Three, if the antecedent is false and the consequent is false. A disjunction is true if either of the two sides is true. So if we go back to our previous example, 
if we have Dr. K lives in Hokkaido and Dr. K is married, that's true, they're both true. If we have Dr. K lives in Hokkaido and Dr. K writes novels, the disjunction Dr. K lives in Hokkaido or Dr. K writes novels is true because one half of it is true. And because of commutation, we can change the order, it doesn't matter. If both sides are false, it's false. So remember, we looked briefly at exclusive disjunction in the previous video. We won't use it in this class, but if you want to understand how it works, please go back to the previous video. Also remember that we looked at a biconditional or an equivalence one. Remember the conditional does not have the same meaning of equals. It does not mean is. Conditional means if, then. So it matters what the order is. So conjunction and disjunction, you can change the order, it doesn't matter. Conditional, you cannot change the order, it changes what it would mean. This time, we want to look at the concept of proving validity. So we want to understand how we can decide whether an argument is a valid deductive argument or not. So we will call arguments that try to look deductive, deductive arguments, and we will say that valid ones are ones that follow all of the rules you need to be truth preserving, but invalid ones are ones that do not follow all of the rules you need to be truth preserving. So validity. Validity is if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. So we can look at this as somewhat like the table for conditionals. I'm gonna put that up for you. So with a conditional, we had if the left-hand side is true and the right-hand side is true, then it's true. If the left-hand side is true and the right-hand side is false, then it's false. If the left-hand side is false, it is always true. So, how, what do I mean by saying validity is kind of like a conditional? So to test for validity, we need to figure out something. So we're gonna start by looking at every case where the premises are all true. We're going to see if the conclusion could ever be false when the premises are all true. If there's any time when the premises are true but the conclusion is false, the argument is invalid. Why? Because this means that even though we give it true premises, we don't know whether or not our conclusion will be false. So in validity's case, if all premises are true and the conclusion is true, this makes the argument potentially valid. If all premises are true and the conclusion is false, this means the argument is invalid. This means that we have done something wrong. We failed to follow one of our rules. So we only have to look at the cases where all premises are true and the conclusion is false. If we look at the cases where all of the premises are false, it has no connection with whether or not the conclusion is true. It also does not connect to our rules. Our rules are, if we follow all these rules, then if we have true premises, we will have a true conclusion. If we do not follow these rules, the results are unclear. So a truth table is a way to show every possibility for what is true or false for all of the variables in an argument. Thus it can show us every way to get all true premises and then whether the conclusion in those cases is true or false. This is what we call an exhaustive way to check whether an argument is complete. By exhaustive we mean it is complete. We will write every single possibility and see what the results are. So how do we make a truth table? I'm going to start with an argument. Either I will play Power Grid or I will play Carcassonne. These are the names of two board games, Power Grid being a game by Fredman Fries and Carcassonne being a slightly older game, but also a very popular one even today. So second premise, I will not play Carcassonne, so I will play Power Grid. So there are five steps involved in making a truth table. First step, identify the premises and the conclusion and count them. So here we have one premise, two premises, and we have one conclusion, so you have three. Second step, identify and count the variables. I will play power grid, I will play Carcassonne. We have two variables. All right, third step is we're going to make a table with one column for each of the variables, each of the premises, and the conclusion. Finally, we're going to add rows based on the number of variables. So we have two variables. So I will explain how many rows that gives us on the next slide or one of the next slides. So we have, as I said, we have two premises and we have one conclusion, that's three. We have two variables. We are going to need five columns, one, 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 one. So we have the two variables, two premises and the conclusion. We'll write them at the top of it and then we're going to need four rows, why? So each of our variables can be true or it can be false. Remember the law of the excluded middle. So we can have it be true or we can have it be false. 
So then if we have two variables, we have, let's see, true and true, true and false, false and true, false and false. So we have four different things that we can have. So that's why we have four rows. If we had only one variable, we would only need two rows. If we had three variables, we would need eight because we need two times two times two. If we had four variables, we would need 16 rows. So if we had eight variables, we would need 256 rows to use this method to test it. So here I have made one for this argument. I've started it off. So we place the variables on the far left. Then we put the premises next to it. And finally, we put the conclusion over on the side. First, we fill out the variables. So we always fill them out in the same order. This is just a convention. There's no real reason deep down for this. So true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. Then we are going to fill out the premises using our operators. Let's start with negation. So negation means that we do the opposite. So we have not G. So everywhere on the not G row is going to be the opposite. It'll be false, false, true, true. We also have inclusive or. So inclusive or is going to be when both of them are true, then they're true. Or if either of them is true, they are true. So using that, we can fill out the tables. So G or S is true when either of them is true. G or S is true on the 1, 2, 3, not on the 4. And then I already filled out not G for you. For S, we just copy it over. Yeah, for S, we will just be copying over our conclusion. Why are we doing this? Well, we're going to check. So here we have how many rows where all of the premises are true? The answer is only one. So only this third row has the case where all of the premises are true. So if we check that, is the conclusion also true? If the conclusion is true in every case where the premises are all true, the argument is valid. We can skip looking at the first row because it has a false premise. We can skip looking at the second row. It has the same false premise. And we can skip looking at the fourth row because it has a false premise. So I want to show you the same thing. And I want to prove to you that modus ponens is valid. So I'm going to give you two examples. And then I'm going to prove to you that modus ponens is valid. So if people are thirsty, then people should drink water. People are thirsty. Therefore, people should drink water. If a new store opens, Nanami will shop there. A new store opens, so Nanami will shop there. So. For our table, how are we going to make this? So we have two variables. We have a new store opening and we have Nanami shopping there. So we once again have four rows. Since we have two variables, we have two premises, one conclusion. We are going to need five columns. So we have five columns and we have four rows. So the very first two, the variables, we always fill them out the same way. The leftmost variable gets big blocks and then it gets smaller. So we have T, T, F, F. And then the closest variable, T, F, T, F. All right, so I filled that in for you. So now we need to look at our operators and we also can just copy some things over. So we can just copy over the S and the N. So the S as a premise is the same as the S as a variable, T, T, F, F. The n as a conclusion is the same as the n as a variable as well. So it's tf, tf. So now we just need to copy over the s in conditional one by looking at the conditional chart. So a conditional is true when both parts are true. So the first one's t. Conditional is false when the right-hand side is false, but the left-hand side is true. So tf, the conditional is true in the cases where both parts of it are false or where the left-hand side is false and the right-hand side is true. So TF, TT, that's going to be the order that we end up with. How do we test for validity? So let's just review this one more time. We test for validity by looking at every case where all of the premises are true, and we see if the conclusion can ever be false. If there's any time when the premises are true, but the conclusion is false, the argument is invalid. So let's look at the previous slide just for a second or two here. All right, so what are the things we need to look at? We need to look at places where both premises are true. There's only one place where both premises are true. That is the very top. When we look at the very top, we see that both premises are true and the conclusion is true, so we know this is valid. So, so far I've given you two in a row that are valid. I'm going to give you one more that's valid, so we're going to look at modus tollens. 
So modus tollens follows the pattern if P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. If I am using an umbrella, then it is raining. It is not raining, therefore I am not using an umbrella. If the yen is weak, then the dollar is strong. The dollar is not strong, then the yen is not weak. So this is the pattern, so let's work through that. If I am using an umbrella, then it is raining. It is not raining, therefore I'm not using an umbrella. So we have two premises and a conclusion. And again, we have two variables. So we have five columns. And because we have two variables, we have four rows. So the left-hand two, it always goes the same way. When it's two, the left-hand one is TTFF, and the right-hand one is TFTF. And then we can fill out some of the other ones. So not R, using the operator not R is always the opposite of R. So it's going to be FTFT, -FT, not U, opposite of U. So it's going to be FFTT -T if we're going from top to bottom. And then for UR, we look at the table again. So it is true when both of them are true. So the first row, it's going to be true. Second row, left-hand side is true. Right-hand side is false. So it's going to be false. Third row, false true. So it's going to be true. And the fourth row is false false. So it is also going to be true. So again, let's look at our definition of validity. So something is valid if it can only have a true conclusion when the premises are true. For this one, we only need to look at the fourth row. Why? Because this is the only place where we have all of the premises being true. In this case, the conclusion is also true, so we know that the argument is valid. So I just want to pause here. If it were the case that we had two rows that had all true premises, we can't stop if we just see that one of the rows with all true premises has a true conclusion. We have to check to see if both do. If any row has all true premises and a false conclusion, then the argument is invalid. So I showed you disjunctive syllogism before, but I will show it to you again. Either you will eat at Moss Burger or McDonald's. You will not eat at a Moss Burger, therefore you will eat at McDonald's. So we have P or Q, not P, therefore Q. So let's fill that out. So P and Q, T, T, F, F again. Q, T, F, T, F, P or Q, true whenever either of them is true. So we have T, 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 F. Not P opposite of your P column. So it's going to be F, F, T, T. And Q is going to be T, F, T, F. Disjunctive syllogism. So now we finally have one that will be a little bit different. So this argument is also valid. So the only place that has true premises is the third of the rows, and the conclusion is also true. So now let's go on to hypothetical syllogism. Hypothetical syllogism is a little bit different. There's three variables now instead of two. So if I sleep in class, I will get a low participation grade. If my participation grade is low, I cannot pass. Therefore, if I sleep in class, I cannot pass. So let's give another example. If asapi is alive, asapi eats ramen. If asapi eats ramen, our taxes will go up. If asapi is alive, our taxes will go up. Asapi is the name of the character for the city of Asaikawa, for anyone who's watching this that's not from here. So here we've got a much taller table than any of the other ones. All right, what are we going to do here? So when we have three variables, we have eight different possibilities. What are these eight possibilities? Well, we can have one possibility where P, Q, and R are all true. Then we can have P and Q are true, but R is false. Then P is true, Q is false, R is true. So this is kind of tedious. We can have P is true, Q is false, R is false. Then we would have P is false, Q is true, R is true. Then P is false, Q is true, R is false. And we just keep going and we'll get this. So we will have eight different rows. All right. Then we need to look at the conditional table. This is going to be a little bit harder. So going from the very top row, P and Q are both true, so the conditional is true. Q and R are both true, so the conditional is true. P and R are both true, so that conditional is true. Going to the next row, P and Q are still both true, so we have that, so that means that this one is true. Q and R. Now R is false. Since R is false, but Q is true, false. So P is true, 
but R is false, so false. So the first row is TTT, the second row TFF, so third row. So in the third row, P is true, Q is false. So the first conditional, P implies Q is false, but Q is false. What that means is that the next one, since Q is on the left-hand side, Q implies R, it's automatically true. P implies R, P and R are both true, so it's true. Now we get to the fourth one. So P is true, Q is false, and R is false. So P implies Q. The left-hand side is true, right-hand side is false, that's false. The left-hand side of Q implies R. Q is false, so it must be true. It doesn't matter what R is. So then again, P implies R, P is true, and R is false, so this is false. For the last form, since P is false, we know that anything that has P on the left-hand side is true. So we know that the four P implies Q on the bottom half are true, and we know that the P implies R are all true on the bottom half, those last four. So Q implies R. On the fifth one, Q is true, R is true, so it's true. Sixth one, Q is true, R is false, so it's false. Seventh and eighth, Q is false, so we know that it must be true. All right, what does this tell us? We have how many places where all of the premises are true? On my count, we have four. So we have the very first row. We also have the fifth row, and the seventh row, and the eighth row. So what can we do with this information? Well, we need to check. Is the conclusion true in every instance where all of the premises are true? So in the first one, it's true. In the fifth one, it's true. The seventh one, it's true. In the eighth one, it's true. So what that means is that hypothetical syllogism is valid. There is no possibility where all of the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. Deductive arguments dilemma. So dilemma it has the most variables of all of these. So we have I or C. If I, then S. If C, then O. Therefore, S or O. Either you will eat Italian food or Chinese food. If you eat Italian food, you will go to Caesarea. If you eat Chinese food, you will go to Osho. Therefore, you will go to Caesarea or to Osho. Second form of it. Either you will marry Tetsuya or you will marry Shin. If you marry Shin, you will become a mother. If you marry Tetsuya, you will become a mother. Therefore, you will become a mother. So. Let's test and see if this is valid. So let's do it for the one where they're both the same. So let's fill out the left-hand side. I've already done it for you, always the same pattern. So then we basically, on the C column, TF, 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 TF. On the B column, T, T, F, F, T, T, F, F, A, T, 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 F, 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 F. So we always do it that way. This is just by convention. This gets you all the possibilities and it makes it easy for people to look at what you're doing. Now we need to use our operator tables. So or. Or is true if either of the two sides is true. So we're going to get the following. So A and B are both true. True. A and B are both true. True. So that's going to be true for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 of the 8 columns. Only in the bottom two, where both A and B are false, is it going to be false. A implies C. So this is true any time that A is true and C is true or any time that A is false. So we're going to get TF, TF, and then four Ts. So B implies C. This is going to be true any time that B is true and C is true, or any time that B is false. So we're going to get this pattern. We're going to get TF, TT, TF, TT. So we're going to get this pattern. We're going to get TF, TT, TF, TT. What that means is that we have, we have one, two, three places where all of our premises are true. So the first one, the third one, and the fifth one. In all of these cases, the conclusion is also true, so the argument is going to be valid. So I know I've only shown you valid ones so far, but these are also the patterns that I promised you would be valid. So one other important concept when we are looking at deductive arguments, they can actually be much, much longer than anything I've shown you. Every claim is going to be either true or false. That was the law of the excluded middle. Every formula is true or false based on how it connects these things. So A and B, we call it a formula because it has two things in the word and. A good formula also has to have the right number of operators for each claim. So for instance, not P is fine, B and A is fine. 
L and R or C is fine, A or C is fine, A implies B is fine, A or D implies C is fine. But things like the letter B followed by not, not fine, T followed by and and not fine. We have to make sure we have the right number of things and everything is connected well. But let's just look at a different table. So if Dr. K is an American, Dr. K likes pizza. If Dr. K likes pizza, then Dr. K will eat at Mia Boca. Thus, Dr. K likes Mia Boca. So we're going to fix this argument slightly. So I'm going to make it so my conclusion matches Dr. K will eat at Mia Boca. But let's look at this one. So again, we fill out the left-hand side same way as we did before. So we get T, 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 F, 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 T, T, F, F, T, T, F, F, T, F, T, F, T, F, T, F, T, F. Then we're going to get A implies P. It's going to be true when the left-hand side and the right-hand side are true, or when the left-hand side is false. So that's going to give us T, T, F, F, T, 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 T. Then we're going to look at when P implies M. So this is going to be similar to a previous one, so TFTT, TFTT. Then we're going to look at the conclusion that I have stated for this argument. So we just copy that one over. So that's just going to be TF, 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 TF. So now we can look at these conclusions and we can see are there any places where all the premises are true but the conclusion is false. So where are all the premises true? If we look, all the premises are true in the first row. They're also true in the fifth row, the seventh row, and the eighth row. But now we need to look at the conclusion. So when we look at the first row, the premises are true and the conclusion is true. When we look at the fifth row, the premises are true and the conclusion is true. Same thing for the seventh. But we have a problem here, which is the eighth row. In the eighth row, all of the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. If all of the premises are true but the conclusion is false, that means the argument is invalid. If that happens anywhere on the table, the argument is invalid. So we know that this argument is actually invalid. So again, let's just look at our test for validity. The test for validity is that if we have a case where all the premises are true but the conclusion is false, the argument is invalid. Why? Because valid means truth preserving. And truth preserving means if all of the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. But in the argument that we have here, all of the premises are true, but the conclusion is false, so it is invalid. So yeah, let's just look at that again. So in the eighth row, we have all of the premises being true, but we have the conclusion being false. So thank you for joining me for this particular video. I hope that it was instructive for you. I look forward to your questions and other things that you want to ask me during class. Thank you for your time and attention, and I hope that you enjoyed this video. I will provide another video about the short circuit method and also look at some additional problems. I hope that you are enjoying this class, and I look forward to seeing you soon.